Well, I held off doing one of these for so long was to be honest, I didn't think people would have many questions to ask. Turns out I probably could have done a two-parter in the answers. Anyway, lots of great questions, lots of honest answers. Let's get stuck into it. Hello again and welcome back to my channel. Firstly, a huge thank you to all the folk who took the time and effort to send me in a question on a wide variety of topics really, some personal, professional, uh, woodworking stuff, bit disability related stuff as well. And some will require a one word answer and some we're gonna go into a little bit more depth. Now, I think the best way to go about this really is just to get stuck into the questions and I can try and give you as honest an answer as possible. Now, the first one is from one of my subscribers, Old Man Tony, who asked if I did any woodworking or DIY prior to my accident and inj in injury. Uh, the answer to that, Tony, is I did a little bit of DIY. Uh, tools I owned before, I owned a uh, budget JCB sliding miter saw which I bought so I could do the wood flooring in the kitchen something I haven't done before and I also owned a Black & Decker 3-in-1 battery powered multi-tool it was a drill driver, a jigsaw and a sander as well so I used to do little bits and pieces uh, around the house but I didn't do any making or anything like that not until obviously post-injury accident and taking up new skill of woodworking. So I hope that is a in-depth enough answer for you, Tony. Next question is from Rasmo243, who's asking, what is my profession? Well, Rasmo, I am a secondary school music teacher. I have been uh, teaching now for 23, 24 years, and um, was also a professional piano player. So that was my main instrument. So as you could imagine, uh, post-accident and in injury since 2018 has had quite an effect on me. So as I am back in work now, I've returned in a four day a week capacity, but obviously very limited in what I can do in terms of demonstrations for students. But it's not to say I am stopped becoming a teacher because it's something I still very much enjoy and have done for a very long time. Okay, next question is from my YouTube friend, Peter Millard. It says, I have a two pronged question. You started woodworking as a kind of physical therapy rehabilitation after your accident, and you started your YouTube channel as a way of documenting that process. Uh, do you have any regrets? Oh, right, I'll do with that one first. Um, regrets? Not really, Peter. There is actually one aspect of it. I think when I started off, you were absolutely right. It was kind of um, documenting my kind of, I don't like the word, but my journey, if you like, really. But the main reason why I started up the YouTube channel, and it kind of relates to the question from Rasmo, is, and I don't mind sharing this now, I suffered a rather catastrophic uh, breakdown in my mental health. I became... Um, the complete sense of feeling useless and not feeling like I'd be able to conduct and be a positive contribution to society, if you want me to put it that way, really. And I kind of fell into that well of despair, really. And that's what led me to taking up woodworking, which was a suggestion from a counsellor I seen at the time, to trying to take up a new skill. Because instead of living your life constantly imagining how it would be if the accident hadn't have happened. How about learning a new skill? Because then if you make mistakes as you're going along, would you have made those mistakes anyway? Which is a good way to kind of get your mind thinking about different things. And the so the woodworking thing started up and I'd completely lost my self-confidence, self-belief all that kind of stuff really. And I thought YouTube might have been an interesting way of trying to start rebuilding that. And if you see any of my early videos, you will know that I was well hid behind the camera. There was no vocals. There was no, uh, certainly no face-to-face -face stuff. And then as I got a little bit more confident, you would see my arm, <laughs> you know, or, or I'd be talking from behind the camera. And then I made the giant leap of stepping in front of the camera. I think it was my 20 pound FedEx impact driver video. And I started maybe from that to regain a little bit of self-confidence, a little bit more belief in myself. 
and that has definitely helped me in the real world in returning to my job and also uh, myself in terms of YouTube and everything else as well. I think the only regret I had really was once I'd got into actually doing a little bit of filmmaking and videos, I, I kind of, I won't say I lost my way, but I started thinking uh, as other YouTubers do, right, I need to be getting regular content out if I'm going to be uh, make this more successful. Uh, I need to get a video out a week and I need to be doing this and I need to be doing that like everybody else does. And I just sort of had a moment of reflection going, why did I start this out? And I didn't start it out to do that because I felt like I was putting pressure on myself, which wasn't really doing myself any favours. So as you will know now, as videos come out when they're ready, there is no regular slot for them. I just go along at my own pace and primarily for the reason, as I've just said, but also the enjoyment factor of it as well. So I hope that covers that question, Peter. And then the second part is this. And knowing what you know now, more than a year, it's about 70 odd videos and 3,000 3, odd subscribers. What would you advise anyone looking to post their first video onto YouTube? Now, I am not going to use the be yourself line because if you're not going to be yourself, you'll be found out pretty quickly. Um, what I will say is this is why are you doing it? So if you want to put a video out on there, what are the reasons behind you wanting to do it? If you are doing it because you want to be a YouTuber and make money, probably not the best reasons to be doing it in all honesty. If you do it purely for the, you want to do it purely for the enjoyment factor and it's a hobby and you don't care whether you get a hundred views or 10,000 views, great idea to be getting into it. Mine was a little bit more bespoke. Mine was about kind of rebuilding, as I say, my kind of confidence in myself, uh, which is quite a different route to take. And that's the reasons why I get into it. So what I would say suggest to anyone is know the reasons why you're wanting to do it before you actually start out doing it. Okay. Hope that answers your questions, Peter. Anyway, on to the next one. And this is from Avon UK Hot Tubs. Um, I have the Capex UG turning up tomorrow. Excellent. It's been fantastic for me in my um, workshop build at the moment. Absolutely brilliant piece of kit that. Has being on YouTube helped fund your tool buying or have you bought more tools because you're on YouTube? Uh, no, it's not helped fund my tool buying. Any mm, slight amount of money I have made from YouTube has gone into reinvesting into tools, for example. But no, it's not helped fund my tool buying at all, really, to be honest. Uh, and have I bought more tools because I'm on YouTube? Um, no, I don't think that's the reason. The reason why I buy a tool now, the primary reason I look for is it a time-saving device for me. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that later on. Um, because obviously only working with one hand. I started off with a lot of different budget tools, mainly from Aldi, uh, Ferex, Workzone, to find out what suits me and what didn't. And a lot of them are really good. Actually, I've got a video coming out on that soon in a few weeks time. Um, but then if I've upgraded to any premium tools, uh, the major reason being is a time saving device for me. So I can at least try and bring down my production time a little bit. I will never get to be in line with, you know, shall we say, able-bodied folk, um, because things take me a lot longer. But if I can use find a tool that is a time and labour-saving device, then that will get my attention for potential investment. Okay, next question from oh, Bill Carroll, the nicest guy on YouTube um, who comments on my videos. Lovely, lovely Bill. Bill. G'day, buddy. Just wondering, how are the hedgehogs? Uh, the hedgehogs are doing all right, Bill. I am 99% certain the hedgehog house water butt stand that I built has got a, a hedgehogs in there for over the winter in. Still see them around, still got some cameras out there. They seem to be doing pretty well, pal. A definite, the, um, oh, I'm going to have to say it, a positive to come from the kind of lockdown situation or the COVID um, uh, situation that we've been in is there's been so much less traffic on the roads that it did allow the um, severely endangered animals like hedgehogs to maybe have a bit more of a fighting chance. So cheers for that one, Bill. They're doing okay and I need to post 
uh, more updates about them in the future. Okay, uh, next one from um, Polar Bear. I may be thick, but can you explain to me all those hashtag jobbies, how and why that appear at the end of yours and others' descriptions? I think that's more to do with the Instagram, Facebook side of stuff, Will. Um, my understanding is, and I am a complete novice when it comes to social media, is if you hashtag something at the end, for example, disability woodworking, and then someone searches for that, then your videos, your posts, your pictures will appear for that search. So, and an example of that being is an occupational therapist who got in touch with me a couple of months back saying that they'd been um, researching disability woodworking online uh, because one of their clients had had a stroke and was very much into their woodworking and they'd searched and some of my stuff would come up. So she got in touch and asked for some advice, tips on how they could help and support them, uh, any tools and machinery that they think they might benefit from. So that's where they come from. So the disability woodworking, one-handed woodworking, uh, resin tables or whatever they are. Uh, well, I think that's the understanding of how that kind of thing works. I think I'm right anyway. Okay. Um, oh, right. My friend, the Carl Pope over at Carl Pope Woodcraft sent me, um, oh, quite a few. So I'm going to work my way through them, Carl. All right. Um, is the new workshop to push the business and how's the part-time business going? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, the workshop although it is a month behind, is now back up and running. Uh, and it is definitely a uh, thing for me to push a part-time business. I was, as you will all know, if you've watched my previous videos, working in my very leaky, freezing cold garage. And I thought, if I am going to do anything with this, I need a specific, uh, more purposeful working space. So the workshop is, um, and I've got video out next week about the base for it, is going there. And as a result of that, the part-time, uh, the actual business at the moment has had to be stepped right back. I am doing a few bits and pieces for friends and family, um, but the actual heart and soul and everything outside of my real world uh, teaching job, Carl, is going getting the workshop sorted. Now, it is a little bit frustrating because it fell about three or four months behind and it would have loved to have had it up and outside in the garden by about September, which would have given me a run up until Christmas. It hasn't happened. It is what it is. But it means hopefully for next year, I'll have it, planning on having it finished by maybe February, March. And then that gives me a chance to focus on the business side of stuff. All right. Anyway, a few more here, Cal. So here we go. Uh, what's your full-time job? Covered that one. Uh, do your friends and family know about that you do YouTube and do they take the Michael? Uh, friends, uh, family, yes. Uh, very supportive. The odd dig here and there, uh, which is great. And work colleagues starting to find out a little bit more. A few people know and that's kind of a few more people know. So um, starting to get a few requests. Uh, would I be able to do this, that and the other? Um, do you even grapple, bro? Now, I know Carl is very much <laughs> into his uh, martial arts. I did. Um, I did actually, when I was younger, I did karate for ooh, about 10 or 11 years. I did a style called Gojiru and I absolutely loved it. And I kind of stepped away from it really when I went to university. Um, and I've always said this, um, I saw it from about the age of about eight till about 19. And my uh, sensei, my karate instructor, I even say to this day, was the person outside of my family who has had the biggest positive influence on my life okay because just particularly I would recommend uh, the martial arts or anything like that for young people because I think it really is a great way of instilling things like character uh, fitness um, you know those kind of beliefs and also to teach you self-defense as well um, how old are you I'm 45 uh, what channels do you like watching? Obviously, apart from uh, Carl's, <laughs> not just woodworking. Uh, I do enjoy a massive range of woodworking channels. Um, so obviously, apart from Carl, there's Peter Millard's, there's uh, Rag and Bone Brown, there's Frank's Little Workshop, which I love, which I love. There's Grumpy's Workshop, there's Sumo's Projects. Oh, there's going to be lots more that I've actually um, missed out. Uh, but um, apologies to those folk and I'll probably leave a, a list in the description of other ones. Uh, sign of bizarre ones that I've found myself watching and I 
can't figure out why it is necessarily. Uh, in recent times, I started watching a guy called Dennis Bunnick, who is an Australian traveller, but he reviews aeroplane flights. <laughs> I have no idea why I watch it. I do actually because he's a very engaging presenter and I think I've learned a few techniques from him. But he, he flies on different airlines and he reviews their flights. And for some reason, I kind of just enjoy watching them. <laughs> anyway, um, next question. Uh, favourite sport um, uh, to watch? Football. Um, favourite sport in terms of admiration for the athletes is rugby league. Definitely. I think those are, they are the most complete athletes and probably some of the hardest men on the planet. Um, beer or spirits? It would have to be beer, but I do like both. Uh, MMA or boxing? Ooh, to watch. I grew up with my dad watching boxing. My dad was a massive boxing fan. So I grew up around the time, although I was young, uh, Marvin Hagler, Thomas Hitman Hearns, then the middle eights, Nigel Benn, Chris Eubank, then obviously Mike Tyson in the heavyweights. So I'd say to watch, Carl. Probably not going to like this one, but I'd say boxing. In terms of um, if I was recommending one of the others to someone to take up, I'd probably say MMA. Uh, Challenger 2 or T90 in a fight? <laughs> um, I haven't got a coin, Carl, so I'm sorry, mate. I don't know much more about that one. Anyway, next question. Okay, next question is from Niall Fleming, who asks, what's your most inventive one-handed coping method, woodworking or otherwise? I could do a whole video on this, Niall, to be honest, because there's about that many things I've had to learn one-handed. Um, so let me try. Oh, sorry, here's a couple that I think are absolutely brilliant. Pam bought me these. These are basically, they're for runners really, but the laces, so uh, anything like my walking boots and stuff, because I can't tie laces, but these things, they're kind of like a rubber thing and they can hook around the top of my walking boots and on the rest of it, or um, into the actual bit where the laces will go, which means I can now use uh, any of my old shoes or any new shoes that I can find um, with these instead of the traditional laces, they're brilliant. Other things in terms of me regaining some kind of independence, I've got the button. I've only recent, relatively recently started driving again and uh, I couldn't do it without the button on the steering wheel. All right, because I mean, you can in theory, and I know people do and you shouldn't, you kind of drive like this, but you've got to ask yourself that question. How do you correct it if your hand slips off? For me, I can't. So um, the actual button on the steering wheel, it makes it feel nice and secure and I feel safe when I'm driving. In terms of woodworking, uh, there are a lot, a um, uh, million and one clamps, but I will say uh, what my YouTube uh, subscriber and friend, Jeff Wild made for me, which was two, the uh, Carmonious Fins Nickery um, Domino Jig, uh, and also the jig that Jeff made for me, which allows me to change the bit on the domino, uh, uh, which, Without that, Jeff, I wouldn't be able to use the domino machine. So those two um, are uh, definitely uh, fantastic for me now. Uh, anyway, next question. There is another one from Niall, but it overlinks with the question from Polar Bear. And Niall, um, when is Mrs. Leo becoming your apprentice? Keith and Rhea. Uh, Keith gets Rhea to help him out now and again. And Niall said that the channel name includes Leo and Pam, but I don't think we've seen uh, in a video. Right, we kind of put this together. Um, and because uh, Pam, if you seen particularly earlier on, I kind of hijacked the Instagram thing really, uh, because all the social media kind of stuff was Pam's. Uh, she kind of looked after all that because I genuinely having a clue with any of that stuff and I'm learning as I go along. But if you look earlier back in the Instagram feed, Pam is a really talented artist, uh, a creator, I'm gonna say really, because she, as well as painting and drawing, she also makes things uh, and she's got a real gifted eye for design. So we started this kind of out together really and I said I'd look at, you know, some YouTube kind of stuff. Uh, Pam also unfortunately has to live with chronic pain and has suffered with chronic pain in her back. Um, for many, many, many years. So we kind of set this thing up together really to try and give us some kind of um, uh, incentive really to try and kind of push ourselves and um, be creative and try and not let that kind of thing get to you as much as it can do. So uh, yeah, the Instagram thing is LMP Hand Eye Craft, uh, Hand Eye Craft for the YouTube channel. So that's the kind of logo bit if you like. 
Um, will Pam be making an appearance in a future video? Don't know, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Okay, cheers, gents. Okay, next question, I am going to Alistair at Freebird Interiors. And here we go. It says, from your experience adjusting to life with a disability, and specifically the loss of use of one hand, what advice do you have for me as a father of a young child who also has the use of only one hand? What would you say to encourage him as he gets older and realises his limitations? It's a fantastic question, Alistair. And obviously I am not qualified from a psychology perspective or a physiological perspective. I can only relay my observations over the last two and a half years and my thoughts and feelings on this. Um, in any kind of uh, rehabilitation or programmes or things that I've gone to, uh, I've met two types of people. I've met people who've, who have, like myself, who've suffered what is deemed by the medical profession as a life-changing injury. And the pitfalls and difficulties those folk have dealing with it. There's a lot of guys I've met who'd suffered strokes who have similar kind of uh, post uh, problem uh, problems after and also nerve damage stuff. And as well as the actual physical injuries, it then becomes the kind of the mental side of things because they go through the angry phase, the up you know the upset phase the uh why me phase that kind of thing and they fall in and, uh, and run the risk of falling into what is rather unaffectionately referred to as the well of despair uh, because things that they were could easily do in the past they no longer can or are very limited in what they can do i've also met another group of folk who've just had to deal with who've had to um who've always had physical limitation uh, limitations from birth and um, they are probably the most inspiring people I've ever met in my life because they look at things in a different way, all right, because they've never had that ability, say, for example, with one, you know, you're talking about your child just being able to use one hand, you know, they've never had that ability to use uh, the two hands, so they learn to adapt. Uh, and... In my experience, I have a much more positive mindset than, than folk like I did um, because I was spent too long being bitter and angry about what had happened to me instead of looking for um, ways to kind of get around that and, and, and adjust your life accordingly. Uh, the frustrations, I think, uh, people who've suffered limitations from birth experience, obviously, is, as you say, when they get older and... Um, see other folk who can do things easier than them. For to give any advice, Alistair, and this is obviously com really coming from the heart here, is I, I'm, I'm not a person to say go down that route of you can do anything you want, okay? Because I, I don't think it's fair to give people false hope. I would love to be able to sit in front of the piano again and play like, just play the piano like I did for 30 years of my life. Um, I can't do that. Um, whether I can ever do that again, I don't know the reality of it. Probably the longer this goes on, the, 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 the that honest answer is going to be no. And if I fall into that well of despair and go, well, this is just not fair. It's just not on. Um, you know, your life becomes a very difficult way of managing it in your head. So you have to look for other things to do. What what I would say, uh, if, as your child's growing older, is although they might not be able to do anything that they ever want to. Uh, in the future, what they can do, uh, what they are capable of, if they can focus on making that the best that they possibly can, and that's that's the best mindset in my in my book to be. That's why you know in the making side of things, um, I want it. I want whatever I do to be the best as I possibly can, and I think um, with some things I'm making now. And as makers, we all go into, we see shops and the first thing we look at, we look at the shelves and we look, oh, are they square or whatever? I'm kind of wanting to get myself to the stage. And with some things I am going, the disability is irrelevant. You know, I can make something just as good as any able-bodied guy or lady. Um, and that's what I'm aspiring to do in my head. Okay, it might take me a lot longer. Okay, and that that's clearly is the case. But... I would go into shops and I see things and I do genuinely think now I could do a better job myself. I could do, I'm seeing some things and I think, you know what, I could do equally as good, if not better. Now, if your child grows up with that mindset, Alistair, that they can 
they can achieve those kind of things, then surely that's a more positive mindset to be in than look dwelling on what they can't do. And I think as a parent, you've just got to promote what they can do and don't give them false hope, don't give them false stones, but just promote what they are capable of and promote excellence within that as best as they can, as opposed to dwelling on what they can't do, which I think would lead to more negativity, which I think would lead to um, a more difficult mindset. So I have had a lot of time to think about this question, Alistair, and I hope, um, I hope you can see where I'm coming from with that. And I genuinely wish your child the very best as they're growing up and they go on to be incredibly successful at whatever they choose to choose to do. OK, pal. Right. Let's move on. Uh, I've got a question here from DRDL. What's the biggest table you've made in metric if possible? And how do you keep the walls of the polypropylene from bending if the table is bigger? I, I know what you mean now. OK, uh, I think pro probably one I've just recently finished, uh, which is um, because I can make bigger tables now because of my um, router sled that I made from a new Triton um, router. And it was approximately 140 centimetres by 70. It's 140 centimetres by 70 centimetres. And I, I think I know what you mean. When I'm building the polypropylene mould, and I've done a video on this, but I've since kind of refined my technique, if you like. How do you keep the walls nice and square on the side? There is a technique I've been working on, which is much better. If you've got your polypropylene sheet and you take a straight piece of timber and hot glue that down onto the sheet, just a couple of dabs, by the way, and then get your, because this one's quite bent, your polypropylene and butt it up against the piece of wood so it's nice and square and straight. And then if you have loads of hot glue around the outside and then you peel off the, the wood sheet on the uh, the wood piece of timber on the middle and you've got a really nice straight edge on your polypropylene. And what you can do with that, it means there's less waste. Uh, I try to create a minimum amount of waste when working with resin because if you've had a go at resin projects, you know it's not the cheapest thing uh, to get into. So I hope that kind of answers your question there. Um, so yeah, it's a timber, but and then put the polypropylene up against it, hot glue it along the outside, take the timber off, and then I always run a fine bead of cork along the inside to prevent any resin from escaping. Okay, next question. Uh, Sumo, uh, Sumo's projects over in Oz. Um, G'day mate, I'm impressed by your invitation to ask you anything. As a fellow maker on YouTube from Australia, I'd like to ask you, what's your interpretation on community regarding how we can best support one another? Okay, hello to you there Sumo, hope you're keeping well sir. Um, Definitely, I think in terms of uh, makers uh, subscribing, liking, commenting in, in videos, I think uh, always helps. I believe it helps with the uh, YouTube thingamajig, uh, the uh, algorithm. Uh, but also, as I've found recently, as I've thrown myself a little bit more into social media, particularly Instagram, I think actually I've been quite active in that because there's a massive makers community um, on Facebook and Instagram. I've Hope, hope you, I'm not wrong in saying this, but I find, tend to find it a little bit uh, more supportive uh, on Instagram than Facebook. Um, but I think it's a great way to kind of get your profile out there. And I have found since being a lot more active on Instagram, it has drawn more folk towards my um, YouTube channel. OK, it was very kind of Triton Tools actually promoted me in something last week. Uh, it was the Make a Monday thing. And that drew quite a bit of attention to the Instagram account which, because I put the link to the YouTube channel in the bio, and has driven some more people towards having a look and checking out my YouTube account. So yeah, follow all the makers you can, uh, comment in the videos, uh, give them the, the like on the Instagram or the Facebook or whatever, and I think it is a very, very supportive community. I, certainly since I've got involved, I, I can't thank you all enough uh, for all your help and support. So I hope that's uh, it's a good uh, an answer, for, uh, a good enough answer for you there, Sumo. Uh, take care and uh, I'll speak to you soon. So uh, Liverpool related question from uh, Raymond Malone, blue or red? Red. Uh, Dave Wilco, who really won Trump or Biden? Biden. Uh, <laughs> how hard was it to master the use of your tools without the st stability of your second hand? Um, Dave, I haven't mastered anything. <laughs> and I'm very, very kind of you to say that, but mastery is a long, long way down the line. 
Um, but oh, without the stability of your second hand, uh, oh, right? What I have found is, and if any of you make a folk want to have a go at this, is how many of your tools that you're using, particularly your power tools, is your basically your non-dominant hand basically holding the piece in place whilst your dominant hand uses the tool. And I think for the majority of things, that's what happens. So your non-dominant hand can be replaced with a clamp. Um, it just takes a bit of time. It can be a bit fidgety at times. And then the safe operation of a power tool or a tool can be done where, which I'm now classing my left hand as my dominant hand because I'm getting much better at it. Plus it's the only hand I've got to use as it stands. So, um, yeah, um, it, it takes a lot of practice. Uh, um, obviously filming, you don't see all the outtakes uh, in terms of how long it takes to get something prepped uh, to, sometimes. But I am, I must admit, I, you know, things are much more second nature for me now particularly to when I started out. I think some of the tools, when I've upgraded, um, the ease of usability, particularly for someone like myself, uh, is much easier than uh, the budget tools that I owned. Nothing wrong with the budget tools at all, but when you compare, say, a JCB sliding mitre saw to me Festival Capex, it, in terms of usage and ease of use for me, uh, they're just worlds apart. They, they really are. There's no other way to describe it. They're just worlds apart. So uh, thanks for the question, Dave. Um, similar um, uh, from Jeff Mounts over in the US. Um, cheers for this, Jeff. One question I've been wanting to ask is where um, you feel, uh, where do I feel my focus has been doing tasks safely or doing them precisely? How has this been changing as you gain experience? Thanks for putting yourself out there. Okay, uh, great question, Jeff. Uh, safety has always been uh, at the forefront of everything. Uh, do you know, if I was to do something stupid and suffer an accident to my left hand, I would be, uh, or I'd be in an absolute mess. So, um, so if focus has always been safety and not precision early on. Um, but I think as I've got better as a worker, a woodworker, a maker, um, precision as, uh, I, I, you know, my work's become more precise. Uh, also, I think as well as I've upgraded my tools, it has also helped with the precision element, really. Um, I do see comments, not particularly on my channel or something, but, you know, guys who talk about people who've maybe got some of the more premium gear and said, well, you know, I could, uh, with the, the cheapest of tools, do something equally as well. And I'm absolutely no doubt you know, there's loads of folk out there who can, because if you are a skilled uh, carpenter, cabinet maker, woodworker, whatever you want to call yourself, and you've done that for many years, then the the skill is in you and not so much maybe in the tool that you use. But if you have started out from, in effect, scratch, uh, and you don't have those years of skills and you were learning a new skill from the very beginning, and you are literally going in with one hand tied behind your back, um, I will take any help from any kind of tool to make my life uh, more safe and more precise. So things like, for example, the Domino, which is, I've done a couple of videos about, um, and uh, the uh, jigs that go with that, it's made my life um, much more precise without a shadow, without my woodworking, uh, much more precise. Uh, it's safer, and also I had a dowel jig before that, which would have probably taken me a whole day to put a couple of joints together. Whereas with the domino now, I can do that. Um, I'm not far off equally as uh, as an able bodied um, maker. All right, so I hope that's answered your question, Jeff. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think the better I get, the more precise I get. But safety was always the highest priority from the very beginning. Um, okay, uh, I think this possibly is the last one from Xylophone Mark. Hi Leo, I was wondering how you market what you make. Is it just to friends and family or do you sell to a wider audience? It's something I've struggled with and wondered what other makers do. Does your YouTube channel help with this? Um, yes, Mark, uh, good question. Thanks very much for that. Um, the actual kind of making and selling has kind of been 
put on hold a little bit while the workshop is getting developed and made. Um, prior to that, I have to I say, I have done a few bits and pieces, but that's just for friends, family, and friends of friends, really. Uh, I was looking into um, uh, distribution and sales kind of stuff before the, 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 the workshop project took off. Um, and the, the couple of things, I did look at some craft fairs, but I, I did tend to notice because I went to quite a lot. They seem to get a lot of footfall, but not many people buy them, particularly local to where I am. There is one very good one uh, called Vintage Home down in Birkdale, which is not too far from where I live. And that guy has his own unit, if you like. It looks like an old school gym, actually, and he does upcycling furniture. But once a month, he has a sale, um, obviously, when things, you know, resume to whatever normal is uh you have to apply for that but i've been to a couple of those uh pre-lockdown and uh they had a wide variety they had like um metal workers and uh woodworkers and candle made but i did see quite a lot of people in but people spending money as well so that's one i definitely want to apply to do uh in terms of getting things into shops that's a little bit more difficult i've made a couple of inquiries about that but it is quite a large percentage uh cut that they want to take which is fair dues you know, they've got to pay for their shop, they've got to make a living, but it, it then makes your profits, if you like, marginable, if not negligible, really. So uh, the other option, which I want to explore next year is probably Etsy, um, which is something I probably will go down the lines of. And I'm also, I have bought the rights or the uh, rent of a uh, a website name which I'm going to launch next year been meaning to do it for ages just haven't had a chance so I'd either look probably to sell things through my website Etsy is going to be one um, probably local but also I think uh, word of mouth is probably the best uh, does YouTube guide n not really no to be honest I think if anything um, Instagram will be more of a driver of things like sales because you can pretty much post stuff up on there and folk who've got to know me who are local through Instagram or Facebook will then get in touch that way. So I'd say probably the social media stuff and not so much the Facebook stuff, but I think Facebook can definitely help to raise your profile. Um, particularly if you can grow your Facebook channel, then it can help, you know, obviously raise your profile as a name, uh, as a brand, if you want to call it that. Um, and that can obviously help to promote uh, when you go into the kind of sales kind of thing. So I hope that makes sense. I hope I've waffled a little bit on that one. I'm conscious of that, but I hope that can kind of help you, Mark. Uh, definitely look at the social media side of things. I haven't looked at Facebook Marketplace, and that's another one uh, I probably am going to look at for the future. And that pretty much brings us to the end of it. Uh, I say once again, I'd just like to thank everyone for sending in their questions, and I hope I've been able to uh, answer them as genuinely and as honestly as possible. Uh, as everyone, uh, take care, look after yourselves, and I'll see you soon. Thank you.